Hi, I'm Sal from our next make. And today, I'm going to show you everything you need to know to become comfortable with surface modeling. We'll start by taking a look at a design that was built using solid features, and then we'll build a similar design from scratch using surface modeling. Let's get started. This is the drawer handle design from my kitchen cabinets. It was built in a very traditional way using solid modeling techniques. Let's take a look at how it was built. The first feature constructed this arc shape, and the underlying sketch followed best practices for solid modeling. It used a simple, closed profile. To refine the shape a bit, a cut was then made, and it too had an underlying, simple, closed sketch. What's interesting here is that the cut was set to remove all the material outside of the profile, as opposed to the default of cutting everything inside the profile. To create the mounting bosses on the underside, another extrude was added, this time with a sketch that had two closed profiles in it. After one was sketched, it was mirrored about a center line. This extrude had 8 degrees of draft added to it to give it its tapered look. Lastly, a few fillets were added as well as two tapped screw holes. This is a very standard solid modeling approach and an efficient way to model a design like this. But let's try to design something similar using surface modeling. The big difference between the two methods is that in surface modeling, you have the opportunity to focus on one face of your design at a time. This focus typically allows you to achieve a higher level of control over your shape. But many of the tools you'll use in surface modeling are the same as or similar to solid modeling. To create the arc shape of the handle, we'll start with a sketch much like we normally would. But here, we'll use an open profile. This is another difference between the two methods. In surface modeling, you'll find yourself using many more open profile sketches compared to solid modeling. Here, we'll make a mid-plane surface extrusion. And although the property manager is almost identical to a solid extrude, we'll notice that the result is an infinitely thin surface body. In fact, we'll see that the feature manager now shows us a surface body folder. To refine the shape of the handle, we'll create the same closed profile sketch as we saw in the solid model and take a moment to fully define it. Pro tip, hold down the shift key while dimensioning to arcs to force SOLIDWORKS to dimension to the min or max locations on the arc where you select it as opposed to always dimensioning to its center. Now, instead of using a cut, we'll use a trim and decide whether to keep or to remove the pieces that we select. That's another difference between the two methods, by the way. In solids, we use cuts to remove material. In surfaces, we use trims. Now that the first face of our design is the way we want it, we can turn our attention to creating more surfaces. Again, we'll use a sketch to get started, and this time we'll use a spline to draw the shape. There's a whole lot we could cover on the topic of splines, but here, we'll simply draw a style spline and add constraints to its control polygon to achieve a symmetric behavior. After adding a few dimensions to fully define the sketch, we'll mirror the geometry. And then, use the planar surface command to build two more surfaces. This command is super simple and quickly creates a surface body out of each closed profile in your sketch. As you can see, we now have three surface bodies. That's another important distinction between surface and solid modeling. In solid modeling, the default behavior is to always merge things together as you add or remove material. In surface modeling, the default behavior is to build separate bodies. In fact, SOLIDWORKS uses this blue edge color to signify that the edges are unmerged surface edges. If they were merged, they would appear black, just as solid body edges do. To build the last face in this design, we're going to use a really powerful surface command called boundary. You can think of it as a loft in two directions. But first, we'll create one more sketch using another style spline. To make sure the endpoints are properly positioned, we'll add pierce relations between the spline points and the edges of the upper surface. Then we'll take another moment to fully define the sketch like we did before. In the Boundary Surface Property Manager, you'll notice Direction 1 and Direction 2 input fields. Notice that we get a preview of the resulting surface as we select the three curves along the bottom of the handle. But the surface isn't exactly what we want until we add the two edges on the top of the handle into the Direction 2 field. At this point, the design looks the way we want, but all of those blue edges, as well as the four bodies in the surface body folder, remind us that we have one step left. You see, even though we may model things using surfaces, more often than not, our goal is to end up with a solid. So we'll use the knit command to bring everything together. In one step, it can merge all the surface bodies into one closed volume and turn it into a solid. Now we can add any other solid features to this design. Here, we'll add a few fillets, but do keep in mind that you can mix and match solid and surface geometry through your design to achieve whatever you imagine. For fun, let's make a few design changes using Instant 3D. 
It allows us to dynamically drag our dimensions and watch the model update in real time. That looks great. We just saw two designs created with two different approaches, and we saw the fundamental differences between solid and surface modeling. I hope this video helped you become comfortable with surface modeling. And if it did, I hope you share it with your friends so that they can learn as well. And if there are other things that you'd like to learn about modeling in SOLIDWORKS, please let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on our next make.